Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with Plato's Republic. So just a quick review, as I always do, of where we ended off last time. Let me jump now to the book. Okay, so here we see that last time, um, that guy named Thrasymachus, he gave some of his arguments for why he thinks that the best thing, the most virtuous thing, is to be unjust to such an extreme that nobody holds you accountable. And Socrates, after all of that, says that he does not agree. He does not think that injustice is more profitable than justice, not even if one gives it free scope and does not hinder it of its will. I'm going to jump a little bit more because after they had a little more discussion about that, Socrates then says that a far weightier matter seems to me, Thrasymachus's present statement, his assertion that the just, that the life, sorry, of the unjust man is better than that of the just. Um, let me jump ahead a little bit now. Um, I'm going to go to the next page here, where we see that Thrasymachus called justice a noble simplicity, and he called injustice goodness of judgment. Now, Socrates then picked up on this and he put together an argument. It took a few steps, but first he got Thrasymachus to agree that the just man does not claim or wish to outdo the just man, but only the unjust. So a just man would never try to undo, to take advantage of or outdo another person who's also just. But they would do better than the person who is unjust. Whereas the unjust person wants to do better than everybody says the unjust man will overreach and outdo also both the unjust man and the unjust action and all his endeavor and will be to get the most of everything for himself. So the unjust person always wants to be number one, right? And then Socrates picked up on that. So he got him to agree to that. And then he built an argument bringing in the idea of likeness. That the unjust man is like the intelligent and good. That was Thrasymachus's argument. He then gave him some examples, the musician and the medical man or the doctor. Um, so they brought in those examples and got Thrasymachus then to agree. And now I'm at the bottom of page 91 that the one who knows then is the wise one. The musician who knows how to tune their instrument is the wise one and the doctor who knows medicine is the wiser one and Thrasymachus agreed I'll say so and the wise is good and he got Thrasymachus to agree to that as well then he concluded he who is good and wise will not wish to overreach his like but his unlike and opposite it seems so Thrasymachus says and I'm at the top of 93 but the bad man and the ignoramus will overreach both like and unlike. So it appears. And does not our unjust man, Thrasymachus, overreach both unlike and like? Did you not say that? Yes, he did. But the just man will not overreach his like, but only his unlike? Yes. Then the just man is like the wise and good. And the unjust is like the bad and the ignoramus, it seems likely. But furthermore, we agree that each is such as that to which he is like. Yes, we did. So now he can drop the word like and say that the just man has turned out on our hands to be good and wise and the unjust man bad and ignorant. And that was where the argument ended last week. So now we're going to pick it up at section 22. We see that Thrasymachus made all of these admissions, not as I now lightly narrate them, but with much balking and reluctance and prodigious sweating. And being summer, it was then I beheld what I had never seen before. Thrasymachus blushing. But when we did reach our conclusion that justice is virtue and wisdom, 
and injustice, vice, and ignorance. Then Socrates jumps in, and uh, Jacob, you willing to be Socrates again? Of course. Okay, thank you. Good. Let this be taken as established. But we were also affirming that injustice is a strong and potent thing. Don't you remember, Thrasymachus? I remember, but I don't agree with what you are now saying. Either. Ah, with what you're now saying, either. And I have an answer to it. But if I were to attempt to state it, I know very well that you would say that I was delivering a harangue. Either then, allow me to speak at such length as I desire, or if you prefer to ask questions, go on questioning. And I, as we do for old wives telling their tales, will say, very good, and not assent. And dissent. No, no, not counter to your own belief. Yes, to please you, since you don't allow me freedom of speech. And yet, what? And yet, want more? What more do you want? Nothing, indeed. But if this is what you propose to do. Do it, and I will ask the questions. Ask on, then. This, then, is the question I ask, the same as before, so that our inquiry may proceed in sequence. What is the nature of injustice as compared with justice? For the statement made, I believe, was that injustice is a more potent and stronger thing than justice. But now, if justice is wisdom and virtue, it will easily, I take it, be shown to be also a stronger thing than injustice, since injustice is ignorance. No one could now fail to recognize that. But what I want is not quite so simple as that. I wish Thrasymachus to consider it in some such fashion as this. A city, you would say, may be unjust and try to enslave other cities unjustly. Have them enslaved and hold many of them in subjection. Certainly. And this is what the best state will chiefly do. The state whose injustice is most complete. I understand that this was your view. But the point that I am considering is this. Whether the city that thus shows itself superior to another will have this power without justice, or whether she must of necessity combine it with justice. If what you were just now saying holds good, that justice is wisdom, with justice, if it is as I said, with injustice. Admirable, Thrasymachus. You not only nod assent and dissent, but give excellent answers. I am trying to please you. Good, thank you. Um, so going back to the beginning here, we see that it was that Thrasymachus's um, attitude is quite different here, right? He's, um, he, he's gone from arguing to just saying, just whatever, you, say whatever you want, Socrates. Now, he wants to go on along. He wants to speak at length. But he knows that Socrates isn't going to go for that. So he says he's just going to nod assent and descent. And uh, it's not really what Socrates wants, but he still says, OK, I'll ask questions. So this is the choice, right, that Socrates was given. Either just let him talk at length or do it this way. 
Why do you think Socrates agrees to just uh, keep asking questions instead of letting him speak? What do you think of that? I think he would just speak himself into more and more uh, indefensible positions. So just mm -hmm. creating more and more work for Socrates mm -hmm. to get through, maybe. Mm -hmm. You think Socrates is a person who backs away from a lot of work? I don't think so, but I think it's easier to go through mm -hmm. without like yeah. so much, you know, like front loaded all of the problems. I think that you see the point here, but you just it's hard to pinpoint what it is. Um, so let me ask you a few more questions. Um, so you see that it would be troublesome for Socrates to just let this guy talk at length. Right, right. right. What does Socrates want to do instead? We'll have him answer the questions, mm. for one. Mm. Mm. Let me... Um, let me highlight one line here. And I am looking, I realize that you guys are not seeing the screen that I'm looking at. Um, so I'm looking at 351A. Where um, Socrates says, um, if this is what you propose to do, do it and I will ask the questions. This then is the question I ask, the same as before. So that our inquiry may proceed in sequence. So what is Socrates looking for? So he's got that sequence, right? He's mm. got yes. uh, a way to dialectically mm -hmm. progress through this uh, mm. definition of justice. Mm. Right. Yeah. So he recognizes that Thrasymachus is just all over the place. Right. And there's oh. no point letting the guy talk at length. But Socrates has a sequence in mind. Right. He's following a certain logical logos, a sequence here that he wants to keep it on. And so he wants to control. And so what's the first question then that Socrates wants to ask? It's the very next sentence. Either of you can jump in. What's the first question? that justice is more potent and stronger or that injustice, you know, discounting that injustice mm. is more potent and stronger mm. than justice. Okay. Yeah. He brought in the idea of power. Um, just before that, he asks, what is the nature of injustice as compared with justice? And right. So I see that. that. Yeah. So that brings them into the question of power and the point he wants to consider we see actually at the bottom of the page, and this is where power really comes in. It's right at the bottom of the page here. The point I'm considering is this, whether the city that thus shows itself superior to another will have this power without justice or whether she must necessarily combine it with justice. Okay, and so this is where the idea of power has come in. Okay, so this is where it's going from here. And so now we're going to go into the functioning. So from power, he's going to go into functioning, and that's the next section. Okay, any other comments, by the way, before we go on? That seems to be the triad that we were talking about last time. Mm -hmm. He starts by asking what it is, which mm -hmm. is the top, mm -hmm. and then the middle term, power, mm -hmm. and then activity, how yes, it functions. Exactly. Yeah, and that is the classic. Um, triad being life and intellect matches to what it is, um, its power and its activity. So he starts mm -hmm. by going straight for the topic. If yes. he's not able to answer it properly, he goes mm -hmm. one step down. Mm -hmm. And then if, if he's not able to answer that, mm -hmm. give a good answer about power, he goes to the first step. Okay, we have to mm -hmm. start from step one. 
would one state function, act mm -hmm. in a in a way of enslaving another mm -hmm. state? Let's start there. Do you mm -hmm. think that's the methodology he's mm -hmm. following? Hmm. That's one way to think about it, I suppose. But also you can think about also the triad is always looked at together as a unity. And so you have to understand the power and the activity in order to understand what it is. Right. The right. Three, so if the he three components, sorry, of the one. Hmm. Right. So I mm -hmm. suppose if he was able to answer the, the top term mm -hmm. and give a good answer of a definition, mm -hmm. the other two would be taken for granted and you mm -hmm. wouldn't have to... Um, Mm. waste time with discussions about those things. Right. Yeah. So we want to bring in all three. And so we're going to, so let's go on to the next section here. Um, where, so th just to remember here, Thrasymachus answered that if you were, what you were just now saying, Socrates holds good, that, that justice is wisdom, then it would, that power would be with justice, but Thrasymachus thinks it would be with injustice. Um, Great, you do more than just not in assent. Um, and he says, I'm trying to please you. And we'll pick it up from there. Very kind of you. But please me in one thing more. And tell me this. Do you think that a city, an army, or bandits, or thieves, or any other group that attempted any action in common could accomplish anything if they wronged one another? Certainly not. But if they didn't, wouldn't they be more likely to? Assuredly. For factions, Thrasymachus, are the outcome of injustice and hatreds and internecine conflicts. But justice brings oneness of mind and love. Is it not so? Internecine. That means um, that both sides are hurt. Mm. Love and oneness of mind. So be it, not to differ from you. That is good of you, my friend. But tell me this, if it is the business of injustice to engender hatred wherever it is found, will it not, when it springs up, either among free men or slaves, cause them to hate and be at strife with one another and make them incapable of effective action in common? By all means. Suppose then it springs up between two. Will they not be at outs with and hate each other and be enemies both to one another and to the just? They will. And then will you tell me that if injustice arises in one, it will lose its force and function? Or will it nonetheless keep it? Have it that it keeps it. And it is not apparent that its force is such that wherever it is found, in city, family, family camp, or in anything else, it first renders the thing incapable of cooperation with itself owing to faction and indifference and secondly an enemy to itself and to its opposite in every case the just isn't that so by all means then in the individual too i presume its presence will operate all these effects which it is its nature to produce it will in the first place make him incapable of accomplishing anything because of inner faction and lack of self-agreement. And then an enemy to himself and to the just. Is it not so? Yes. But, my friend, the gods too are just. Have it that they are. So too, the gods also, it seems, 
the unjust man will be hateful, but the just man dear. Revel in your discourse without fear, for I shall not oppose you so as not to offend your partisans here. Fill up the measure of my feast, then, and complete it for me, by continuing to answer as you have been doing. Now that the just appear to be wiser and better and more capable of action, and the, in, and the unjust incapable of any common action, and that if we ever say that any men who are unjust have vigorously combined to put something over, our statement is not altogether true. For they would not have kept their hands from one another if they had been thoroughly unjust. But it is obvious that there was in them some justice which prevented them from wronging at the same time one another too, as well as those whom they attacked. And by dint of this, they accomplished whatever they did and set out to do injustice only half corrupted by injustice, since utter rascals, completely unjust, are completely incapable of effective action. All this I understand to be the truth, and not what you originally laid down. But whether it is also true that the just have a better life than the unjust and are happier, which is the question we afterwards proposed for examination, is what we now have to consider. It appears even now that they are, I think, from what has already been said. But all the same, we must examine it more carefully. For it is no ordinary matter that we are discussing, but the right conduct of life. Proceed with your inquiry. I proceed. Tell me then, would you say that a horse has a specific work or function? I would. Would you be willing to define the work of a horse or of anything else to, to be that which one can, on, can do only with it or best with it? I don't understand. Well, take it this way. Is there anything else with which you can see except the eyes? Certainly not. Again, could you hear with anything but your ears? By no means. Would you not rightly say that these are the functions of these organs? By all means. Once more, you could use a dirk to trim vine branches and a knife and many other instruments. Certainly. But nothing so well, I take it, as a pruning knife fashioned for this purpose. That is true. Must we not then assume this to be the work or function of that? We must. Okay. Thank you. So we'll stop there for a moment. And I want to go back to the beginning of the section because this whole argument was built on an agreement about what is the function of injustice and what is the function of justice. So if you go back to page 97, the beginning of this section, you can find what they say is the function of injustice and justice. And who can tell me what it is? Is it the part that's underlined? The justice? <laughs> well, <laughs> does that look like it? <laughs> tell me, did this person underline the right thing? I think so. Mm. Justice brings oneness of mind mm -hmm. and love. Hmm. And what does injustice do? 
hatred and the new word conflicts that hurt everyone yes yes internal scene conflicts so um this is an idea that's going to come up again the idea of what pulls what gives things unity and allows them to function well together and what tears things apart here we're seeing it in terms of justice and injustice this is going to come up again um, I think it's book four. It comes up again. Um, so we want to hold on to this idea. OK, but yeah, so now he's giving a bunch of arguments about it. And it really comes together nicely, I think, at the end of this section. Where he talks about like even criminals, if they don't work together. They're not able to really be effective, right? Like a group of bank robbers can be effective because they work together. So there's a certain justice. Right. There's a certain code among criminals. Right. The criminal code is what allows them to function as criminals. And so there's this idea of this justice even within groups that are otherwise unjust. Right. So justice brings things together and holds it together in a unity. Injustice breaks it apart. Even pirates have a code of honor, says one There piece. you go. Right. Yes. Honor among pirates. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so now he's going on now to the idea of function, that each thing has its own proper function, right? There are many times of types of blades, but only a pruning light knife is ideal for pruning branches, right? Okay, let's carry it on from here. You will now then, I fancy, better apprehend the meaning of my question when I asked whether that is not the work of a thing which it only or it better than anything else can perform. Just trying to find where we are. 103. 103. Section 24. Uh, pruning knife. I oh, write. Uh, four, four lines into section 24. Well, work said. of the thing which, which it mm -hmm. only or it better than anything else can mm -hmm. do. Well, I do understand and agree that the work of anything is that. Very good. Do you not also think that there is a specific virtue or excellence of everything for which a specific work or function is appointed? Let us return to the same examples. The eyes, we say, have a function. They, they have. Is there also a virtue of the eyes? There is. And was there not a function of the ears? Yes. And so also a virtue. Also a virtue. And what of all other things? Is the case not the same? Ooh, the same. Take note now. Could the eyes possibly fulfill their function well if they lacked their own proper excellence and had in its stead the defect? How could they? It's still your line. Oh, for I presume you meant blindness as the defect instead of vision. Whatever the excellence may be, for I have not yet come to that question, but I'm only asking whether whatever operates will not do its own work well by its own virtue and badly by its own defect. That much you may safely affirm to be true. And then the ears, too if deprived of their own virtue, will do their work ill? Assuredly. And do we then apply the same principle to all things? I think so. 
Then next, consider this. The soul. Has it a work which you couldn't accomplish with anything else in the world? As for example, management, rule, deliberation, and the like, is there anything else than soul to which you could rightly assign these and say that they were its peculiar work? Nothing else. And again, life. Shall we say that too is the function of the soul? Management, rule, deliberation, and life. Most certainly. And do we not also say that there is an excellence or virtue of the soul? We do. Will the soul ever accomplish its own work well if deprived of its own virtue? Or is this impossible? It is impossible. Of necessity, then, a bad soul will govern and manage things badly, while the good soul will in all these things do well. Of necessity. And did we not agree that the excellence or virtue of soul is justice and its defect injustice? Yes, we did. The just soul and the just man then will live well and the unjust ill. Well, so it appears by your reasoning. But furthermore, he who lives well is blessed and happy, and he who does not the contrary. Of course. Then the just is happy and the unjust miserable? So be it. But it surely does not pay to be miserable, but to be happy. Of course not. Never then, most worshipful Thrasymachus, can injustice be more profitable than justice? Ah. <sighs> Let this complete your entertainment, Socrates, at the Festival of Bendis. A feast furnished by you, Thrasymachus. Now that you have become gentle with me and are no longer angry, I have not dined well, however, by my own fault, not yours. But just as gluttons snatch at every dish that is handed along and taste it before they have properly enjoyed the proceedings, so I, methinks, before finding the first object of our inquiry, what justice is, let go of that and set out to consider something about it, Namely, whether it is vice and ignorance or wisdom and virtue. And again, when later the view was sprung upon us that injustice is more profitable than justice, I could not refrain from turning to that from the other topic. So that for me, the present outcome of the discussion is that I know nothing. For if I don't know what the just is, I shall hardly know whether it is a virtue or not, and whether its possessor is or is not happy. Okay, and that's the end of book one. So we still have to go on to find out what justice is. So we've got our cliffhanger there. Um, but before we go on to book two, Let's uh, make sure we understand this section. So remember, Socrates said he wanted to look at things in sequence. So first he asked, what is the nature of justice and injustice? Then he went on to asking about functioning. And then he went on to talk about the excellence of each thing. So let's make sure that we're clear on what he's saying about the soul. So all the other stuff, of course, the eyes and whatnot, that's all examples. What we really want to look at is the soul. So what is what does he say is the function of soul? Well, 
have the section found yet, but it's management mm. of the soul, like yes. proper ordering. Good. Yes. I'm having a hard time with my mouse for some reason. Yes, management, rule, deliberation, and the like was part of it. And they also added something else to it. Is it life? Life, right. Yeah, and anyone who has read the Phaedrus remembers that there... Um, life is the de- life in movement is how Socrates defines the soul. It's what gives life in movement. And so it manages rules and deliberates. Right. So soul rules over the body. Right. It, it's what manages us. And so then the excellence then would be connected to that. So what then would be the excellence of the soul? The good soul and the bad soul. The good soul would manage things well. Mm. The bad soul would manage them badly. Exactly. Right. And so there he's able then to to define at this point here the virtue of the soul as justice. Excellence or virtue of the soul is justice. Uh, Maybe it's going to do it correctly. Okay. I know you guys can't see the highlighting I'm doing here, but I'm having a really rough time highlighting for some reason on this particular PDF. Yeah, so the excellence or virtue of soul is justice. Now, what we see in different dialogues is that, yes, we've got our four virtues and sometimes holiness is also considered a fifth one. Um, But they often, oftentimes will talk about virtue as a unity. And sometimes he'll call it wisdom and in other dialogues, he'll call it temperance. In this dialogue, he's going to call it justice. So what he's going to do in some of the future books is he's going to lay out each of the four virtues and then tie them together and call them all justice. And we'll see how he does that and why he does that the way he does. But here we already see we basically got the whole book in book one. He's done. He defined it. But we still got nine more books to go. So it's not laid out clearly enough, right? To someone who's already read this or who's thought about this, who's coming at it from a state of mind that's more in line with Socrates's, it's easy to see that in book one, he's already laid it all out. But to the person like Thrasymachus or coming from a more, from a conventional state of mind, even if you're more in line with Socrates is thinking, if, you're, if you haven't yet understood his understanding of justice, it's not at all clear. And so we've got to go further. And so he says at the end here that we still haven't really clarified what justice is. We can see from this argument, if you're following this argument, that it concludes by saying that the just person, the person who has a just soul, is going to be happy. But we don't really, if we don't really understand what justice is, we don't really know how to apply this to our lives or what it really means. Right. So any any thoughts or comments before we go on to book two? Because they're going to take this much, much further. Yeah, this reasoning process was interesting. <clears throat> I'm surprised that he didn't get any pushback from Thrasymachus. Mm. Um, the idea that um, we can prune a bush with a n- kitchen knife, mm-hmm. um, but it's better to use a pruning knife mm. <clears throat> is fine, but the conclusion and therefore um, there is a certain thing that has a certain function and that's what it's for. I don't know if everyone would agree with that. Um, Some people might say, well, you couldn't say a pruning knife. Maybe a pruning knife has one, but um, a lot of things you can use. You can use several tools to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And even then, the function is something we happen to assign it to. 
Um, maybe one day we use something as a doorstop and the next day we use it as a paperweight. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, there isn't really a one thing that has the function mm -hmm. and the function isn't something inherent. Mm -hmm. So your, your cherry picking, um, examples, the word pruning knife has it in the title. That's it. That's <laughs> easy. Socrates. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then the next step, you, go ahead. I'm sorry. So what do you think Thrasymachus would say then about the soul? Did the, did Socrates assign the wrong functions or are those arbitrary functions? Do you think? Yeah. Um, there isn't a inherent function of the soul. It's whatever we want it to be. Mm, you choose like, how to live mm. your life. Mm -hmm. That's, that's free. That's that we talked about freedom of speech. This is mm -hmm. free will. Mm -hmm. But if you're exercising free will, then is that different from deliberation? Is that the soul that's deliberating and managing and ruling? Well, uh, um, you might, you could agree that mm -hmm. there are these aspects mm -hmm deliberation, um, life or motivating. Mm -hmm. And, um, I suppose you would also inherent in that you would say that there is a, um, a caring mm -hmm. for the soul. Like mm -hmm. the, the ruling and deliberation has to imply that there is something that cares for mm -hmm. our own well being with mm -hmm. its motivate, with its motivating and its reasoning. Mm -hmm. But, um, that doesn't imply that there is an, an intended function to use it towards whatever you want to be. Hmm. I'm not sure how what you said about the soul. I think that it's a good point that you could, you know, we could debate if these, they reached this conclusion rather easily and they didn't discuss why they chose these particular functions. He agreed very quickly. Um, it, it doesn't sound like anything you said that the disagrees or challenges the idea of management rule deliberation. I think a person who's arguing for free will would say that that's what it means to have free will. Oh, but to what you mm -hmm. should be using it towards, mm -hmm. that's your freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. There isn't an intended function, like a, a purpose to which you use these, mm -hmm. these well, aspects. However you direct it, that's its function, is directing it towards what you want to direct it towards. Right, and he's mm -hmm. saying that a pruning knife has its mm -hmm. correct function, mm -hmm. and each thing has its correct function to mm -hmm. which it should be being used. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the case. So they haven't agreed on what it means to manage well or rule well, what you should point it to. The idea of functioning well means that you are directing it in the right direction, and they don't agree on that, definitely. But whatever it means to direct it well, that's virtue. That's its excellence. Do you right. Agree with and that? no, mm -hmm. um, the like uh, he said, um, like eyes has a singular purpose to mm -hmm. which its aspects, like mm -hmm. there's the cornea, there's the retina. It has these aspects. It's like the soul has its aspects. There's a caring, there's a mm -hmm. managing, there's a deliberation, and there's a. Uh, 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 enlivening um, mm -hmm. but he's saying by the way is there something that it should be using these aspects to achieve for eyes it's sight and mm -hmm. for hearing for ears it's hearing mm -hmm. and equally so if it's deficient it mm -hmm. will be blind or deaf um, and his first step was saying well isn't it isn't it easier to prune with a pruning knife? Yes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is an intended purpose, overall function of a pruning knife. And there's one thing that can do it well, a pruning knife. And mm -hmm. you might agree with a pruning knife, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you wouldn't agree. Mm -hmm. And then he made the mm -hmm. next step in, oh, by the way, since we can, uh, since that applies to a pruning knife, you wouldn't mm -hmm. want to use like a, a regular knife to do, to prune your, your, your bushes. Can't we say that of all things? Don't everything, uh, doesn't everything that is in existence come into existence for an intended purpose? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of atheists would say, no, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And a lot of biologists would say, 
No, everything is just haphazard. And mm -hmm. if you want to use a, uh, a pruning knife for that, but you could equally use a pruning knife to, to cut your cheese. Mm -hmm. And that way you can't say the intended mm -hmm. function of a pruning knife is to prune bushes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you make some good points there. And certainly um, things like the pruning knife and the eye example are much easier to understand than the soul. And that's why they're used as examples. The soul clearly is much more difficult to understand what its function is and what its excellence is, which is why we need a whole dialogue on it, where there's no dialogue about how to use them, but what is a pruning knife, All right? That wouldn't be a very interesting dialogue because there's no controversy there. Um, and if you want to use it to cut your cheese or something else, that's nobody's going to really care. Um, but certainly the, the soul is something far more difficult to see and i think that really what you're pointing to is what socrates said at the end of the section that we still don't know what justice is and how that connects then to function right and the, what is the excellence the function and excellence of the soul to understand why he's tying justice to that right? no I, i'm even soul. earlier i'm at step one hmm. When mm -hmm. he concludes, isn't mm -hmm. there a proper function for something? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I actually remember having this conversation in the first week of a philosophy class at university. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the cl class disagreed. Mm -hmm. No, there isn't an intended function for things. Mm -hmm. That it's, that implies yeah. that there is some divine God who mm -hmm. said you have to do this and you have to mm -hmm. do this. And and most of the class were atheists, so. Mm -hmm. It mm. wouldn't follow that there is a single function and a purpose mm. for all things. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point that you're raising here, that this is something that it's not easy for people to see why Socrates would reach that conclusion. And yes, Thersimachus was rather quick to agree to it. But um, well, let's go on then to book two, though, and see where they're going to go from here, because they these are still issues that are on the table. I think that's perfectly fair to say that it's not yet convincing at the end of book one. Because it, because it, mm -hmm. it well, the, the issue is, mm -hmm. it implies a destiny. Mm -hmm. His whole reasoning implies a destiny that everything that is exist in creation or existence mm -hmm. has a single purpose. Mm -hmm. And it should be used for that purpose. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and that's its destiny, mm -hmm. um, which isn't something that we accept. We sort of think that, well, everybody can... Like it's the mantra of today's age that you can choose mm -hmm. how to live your life, mm -hmm. meaning life does not have an, inter an inherent meaning or purpose or that you should be trying to reach a goal at the end mm -hmm. of it. It's whatever you want it to be. If you want it to make it about family, if you want to make it about becoming king of the pirates, it's whatever mm -hmm. you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And this whole reasoning implies a completely different worldview. Yes, that each thing mm -hmm. has a purpose mm -hmm. and, and not just, not just a, a pruning knife, mm -hmm. which we can see has a creator and mm -hmm. we can see has a intended um, destiny for which he's um, shaping the knife and giving it life. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pruning knife maker, mm -hmm. the blacksmith or whatever we were called engineer. Mm -hmm. um, but all things, mm -hmm. that's a huge jump. All things, mm -hmm. Um, a rock has a purpose to which it's moving. Um, and I mean, even I, I guess eyes are a little bit easier because it doesn't mm -hmm. really do anything else. But um, but there are some things that have many functions, mm -hmm. like is eyes just to see or is it to convey emotion? Like humans are social creatures mm -hmm. and we convey a lot in our eyes. Mm -hmm. so, um, that that has a survival imperative in the evolution of the of the human species. So who are you, Socrates, to say that the function of eyes are simply to see? There are many functions. Mm -hmm. And so so this mm -hmm. reasoning to a, a pruning knife and therefore all things, two big steps. Mm -hmm. And therefore the object of our inquiry, soul, what's its singular destiny, which mm -hmm. implies some purpose mm -hmm. or uh, in the mind of, of the creator of the soul. Mm -hmm. Um, that's how we got here, mm -hmm. but I was surprised he didn't get any pushback. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, yes, Thrasymachus seems to have given up at this point. And, um, maybe that is just, um, uh, 
literary license because um, Plato wants to um, lay it out in step by step, right, as we go through this whole dialogue. But he does have to show a very different worldview. You're absolutely right that Socrates is going to have to unfold a view of what it means to be human and what is the whole that we're a part of. It's a very large topic. I think that your point is very well taken that a lot of people reading this, especially modern times, would not find book one convincing or not find this ending convincing. And so there's a whole lot more that has to be unfolded. Right, so, right, right. Let's, Although he did at the end, he's a bit hard on himself saying, uh, like a, like a, a like a, someone who's in, um, uh, untempered at a, at a feast he will he will grab this and grab that without following the train of, mm-hmm. of reasoning i did that in um uh talking about before defining what it was we let go of that to set out to consider something about it mm-hmm. namely whether it is vice or ignorance or wisdom and virtue and then the view was sprung upon us that injustice was more profitable Mm -hmm. than justice. And I could not refrain from turning to that other topic. Mm. So, and um, yeah, for, I don't know what it is, Mm -hmm. um, but it is good that he's kind of giving the stakes. Mm -hmm. Like um, we're not going to, we haven't, nailed down what it is exactly but we have concluded that it's necessary to keep yourself from tearing it apart even Mm -hmm. with criminals they need it to function Mm -hmm. and if it uh applies to these functionings of the soul deliberating ruling and and enlivening Mm -hmm. then well you really need it because that's what you are and Mm -hmm. he even says this is a really one of the most important this is an important thing that we're talking about here and hitting the goal, by the way, this is what makes you happy. And this is what makes you mm-hmm. unhappy. And isn't it, it's the whole point. Mm-hmm. So while he hasn't got the specifics, he, he is, he is like setting the table to use the banquet mm-hmm. analogy. Okay. He's, nice. he's saying, mm-hmm. he's giving us the stakes and saying mm-hmm. how important it is to nail it down, which, mm-hmm. which I think was really good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And also one more, po- oh, sorry, mm-hmm. oh, I got one more point to make before we okay. go on, but did you want to respond to that? No, no, go ahead. Well, one uh, point that is really important is at the end of this, um, he's, he says um, that at the bottom of 105, lives well is blessed and happy. Mm. The Greek word for that is eudaimonia, mm. which means of a good daemon. Mm-hmm. So... This is important because um, the role of the daemon is, or the, um, as we saw in the symposium, the um, inner voice Mm -hmm. that is the the voice of the self that communicates from the gods to man and and directs Mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of Socrates' later dialogues, like the Apology, he says, "Um, this is what has guided me in time. Mm -hmm. And even in the Apology, he says, this spiritual being, the daemon, is the difference between the official state religion mm-hmm. and what I am mm-hmm. following. And this is exactly. why I'm guilty and why you're mm-hmm. going to put me to death. Mm-hmm. So at the end, he says, um, this, um, having this just soul with the excellence of the soul means having the good daemon, mm-hmm. which really elevates it. It's not just happiness in a... Um, mm-hmm in a materialist sense or Mm -hmm. dopamine, if you're a reductionist, um, it's being in communion with the good Mm -hmm. spirit guiding your Mm -hmm. life, Mm -hmm. elevating it to a really spiritual Mm -hmm. text Mm -hmm. in this last um, passage, last sentence of this text. That's where it's going, but um, getting a little ahead of us of ourselves here. So let's see where they're going now. I'm at this point here. Um, So going on to book two, page 109 in the text. Uh, When I had said this, I supposed I was done with the subject. But it all turned out to be only a prelude. And this word prelude, by the way, is going to come up again in book seven. 
So there's an interesting way that they use that word. Um, for Glaucon, who is always an intrepid, enterprising spirit in everything, would not on this occasion acquiesce in Thra Thrasymachus's abandonment of his case. Um, he says, Socrates, is it your desire to seem to have persuaded us or really to persuade us that it is without exception better to be just than unjust? Really, if the choice rested with me. Well, then you are not doing what you wish. For tell me, do you agree that there is a kind of good which we would choose to possess, not from desire for its after effects, but welcoming it for its own sake? As, for example, joy and such pleasures as are harmless and nothing results from them afterwards save to have, have and hold the enjoyment. I recognize that kind. And again, a kind that we love both for its own sake and for its consequences, such as understanding, sight, and health. For these, I presume, we welcome for both reasons. Yes. And can you discern a third form of good, under which falls exercise and being healed when sick, and the art of healing, and the making of money generally? For of them we would say that they are laborious and painful, yet beneficial. And for their own sake, we would not accept them, but only for the rewards and other benefits that accrue from them. Why, yes. I must admit this third class also, but what of it? In which of these classes do you place justice. Let me pause for a moment here because I want to make sure that we're clear on the three categories before we hear Socrates' response. Okay, so what are the three classes of goods? What's the first one? You want it just irregardless of mm. its effects. Mm, right. You want it for its own sake. For its own sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without the effects, you're right. Mm -hmm. And then what's the second category? You want it for its own sake and its effects? Exactly. And the third category? You, you don't like it, but you like the reward from it? Mm. Or like Right. So there's the, it, for its own sake, for both its own sake and its consequences, and for the consequences only. Okay, so those are the three categories. Okay, so then he asks Socrates, in which of these classes do you place justice? In my opinion, it belongs in the fairest class, that which a man who is to be happy must love both for its own sake and for the results. Yet the multitude do not think so, but that it belongs to the toilsome class of things that must be practiced for the sake of rewards and repute due to opinion, but that in itself it is to be shunned as an affliction. All right, so Socrates put it in that second category. It's good for its own sake and for its consequences, whereas. What um, Glaucon is saying is that the majority of people would put it in that third class. Like exercise, very few people enjoy it. Some people do, but many people do not. But they know that they need the health benefits. And so the same idea that they don't really care about justice in and of itself, but they want the good reputation and the social rewards of being seen as a just person. OK, so that's where it's going from here. And I think I'd like to go on to the next section before we talk about it, because it's all connected so nicely. Um, OK, so Socrates goes on. I am aware that that is the general opinion. And Thrasymachus has for some time been disparaging it as such and praising injustice. But I, it seems, am somewhat slow to learn. Come now. 
Hear what I too have to say and see if you agree with me. For Thrasymachus seems to me to have given up to you too soon, which, which is also what Jed was saying before, he gave up too soon, as if he were a serpent and that you had charmed, I'm sorry, a serpent that you had charmed. But I am not yet satisfied with the proof that has been offered about justice and injustice. For what I desire is to hear what each of them is and what potency and effect it has in and of itself dwelling in the soul, but to dismiss their rewards and consequences. Okay, so somebody was kind enough to underline this section for us. Um, that's a key sentence there. This is what he wants. What is it in and of itself? Never mind the rewards and consequences. This then is what I propose to do with your concurrence. I will renew the argument of Thrasymachus and will first state what men say is the nature and origin of justice. One. Secondly, that all who practice it do so reluctantly, regarding it as something necessary and not as a good. So that's the second. And thirdly, third, that they have plausible grounds for thus acting, since forsooth the life of the unjust man is far better than that of the just man, as they say. Though I, Socrates, don't believe it. Yet I am disconcerted when my ears are dinned by the arguments of Thrasymachus and innumerable others. But the case for justice, to prove that it is better than injustice, I have never yet heard stated by any as I desire to hear it. What's key about that line right there? I've never heard this. What is Plato telling us? Is he going to do something that's been done many times before? If he no. can pull this one off. He's trying to innovate on the mm. you know, philosophy here. Right. He's stating he's giving us something we've never heard before. What I desire is to hear an encomium on justice in and by itself. And I think I am most likely to get that from you, Socrates. For which reason I will lay myself out in praise of the life of injustice, and in so speaking will give you an example of the manner in which I desire to hear from you, in turn, the dispraise of injustice and the praise of justice. Consider whether my proposal pleases you. Nothing could please me more. For on what subject would a man of sense rather delight to hold and hear discourse again and again? That is excellent. And now listen to what I said would be the first topic, the nature and origin of justice. Okay, so this is the argument from the perspective of the person who's praising injustice, right? By nature, they say, to commit injustice is a good, and to suffer it is an evil. But that the excess of evil in being wronged is greater than the excess of good in doing wrong. So that when men do wrong and are wronged by one another in taste of both, those who lack the power to avoid the one and take the other determine that it is for their profit to make a compact with one another neither to commit nor to suffer injustice, and that this is the beginning of legislation and of covenants between men, and that they name the commandment of the law, the lawful and the just, and that this is the promise between, I'm sorry, sorry I skipped a line, and that this is the genesis and essential nature of justice. It is a compromise between the best, which is to do wrong with impunity, and the worst, which is to be wronged and to be impotent to get one's revenge. By the way, my major in university was political science, and this <laughs> sounds very much like what I heard in many of my classes. Justice, they tell us, being midway between the two, is accepted and approved not as a real good, 
but as a thing honored in the lack of vigor to do injustice, since anyone who had the power to do it and was in reality a man would never make a compact with anybody, neither to wrong nor to be wrong. For he would be mad. The nature then of justice is this, and such is this, Socrates, and such are the conditions in which it originates, according to the theory. Okay, so according to this argument here, what is the nature of justice and the origin of it? Can you put it in your own words? Either of you? <laughs> I probably can't, but they, he says it's midway between the mm. two. Mm. Right. What are the two? not good and bad it's advantage and disadvantage hmm. i'll give you it right at the top of the page by nature ah yeah good and bad okay good and evil yeah. hmm. but evil as bad yeah huh. or more specifically is to commit injustice is a good but to suffer it is an evil and so the compromises between the two we would love to be able as thrasymachus said to commit injustices with impunity but since we cannot we realize okay i want to do injustice but i don't want to suffer it so i'll agree to be a good person if you agree to be a good person and not wrong me and we'll live in harmony And I think that if you go to political science classes anywhere in the United States and probably in Australia as well, you're going to hear this idea as the beginning of legislation. Okay, so that's right. Where he... we're, we're in nature, bad people, we're mm. in nature, greedy and selfish and mm. want to do, do bad for our own yes. immediate pleasures and get away right. with it. But we know we can't. It'd be a crazy world. Mm -hmm. Like it'd be the world of pirates mm -hmm. if we lived like that. Mm -hmm. So, so we compromise and exactly. and sort of shake yeah. hands and say, well, "I know you're evil. You know I'm evil. But let's kind of be all right with each other." Mm -hmm. Until, of course, I can I get rich enough to set up a gated community, mm -hmm. and um, until I figure out a way to wrong you with impunity. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And it's mm -hmm. common to see mm -hmm. people with political power to mm -hmm. to celebrate mm -hmm. how clever they are to get away with their uh, evading taxes and, and getting super rich. But as soon as mm -hmm. they're um, put on trial, they um, throw their arms up mm -hmm. and say, hey, don't be unfair to me. Shouldn't mm -hmm. we all be nice to each other? <laughs> um, there's a catchphrase. Um, yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. Look forward. like. Come on, let's not look back in the past. Yes. Let's let's think about right. going forward together yes. whenever let's they're take called the high out. road. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I do want to go on to the second point here, because I think in this next section, he's actually going to cover the second and third points together. OK. Um, but as for the second point, that those who practice it do so unwillingly and from want of power to commit injustice we shall be most likely to apprehend that if we entertain some such supposition as this in thought. If we grant to each the just and the unjust, license and power to do whatever he pleases, and then accompany them in imagination and see whither his desire will conduct each. We should then catch the just man in the very act of resorting to the same conduct as the unjust man because of the self-advantage which every creature by its nature pursues as a good, while by the convention of law, it is forcibly diverted to paying honor to equality. 
The license that I mean would be most nearly such as would result from supposing them to have the power which men say once came to the ancestor of Gyges the Lydian. So here's a story. They relate that he was a shepherd in the service of the ruler at that time of Lydia, and that after a great deluge of rain and an earthquake, the ground opened and a chasm appeared in the place where he was pasturing. And they say that he saw and wondered and went down into the chasm. And the story goes that he beheld other marvels there and a hollow bronze horse with little doors and that he peeped in and saw a corpse within as it seemed of more than mortal stature and that there was nothing else but a gold ring on its hand which he took off and he went forth. And when the shepherds held their customary assembly to make their monthly report to the king about the flocks, he also attended wearing the ring. So as he sat there, it chanced that he turned the collet of the ring towards himself, towards the inner part of his hand. And when this took place, they say that he became invisible to those who sat by him. And they spoke of him as absent. And that he was amazed, and he again fumbled with the ring. He turned the collet outwards, and he became visible. On noting this, he experimented with the ring to see if it possessed this virtue. And he found the result to be that when he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible, and when outwards, visible. And becoming aware of this, he immediately managed things so that he became one of the messengers who went up to the king. And on coming there, he seduced the king's wife, and with her aid set upon the kingdom, and he slew him and possessed his kingdom. If now there should be two such rings, and the just man should put on one, and the unjust the other, no one could be found, it would seem, of such adamantine temper as to persevere in justice and endure to refrain his hands from the possessions of others and not touch them, though he might with impunity take what he wished, even from the marketplace, to enter into houses and lie with whom he pleased, and slay and lose from bonds whomever he would, and in all other things conduct himself among mankind as the equal of a god. And in so acting, he would do no differently from the other man, but both would pursue the same course. And yet this is a great proof, one might argue, that no one is just of his own will, but only from constraint, in the belief that justice is not his personal good, inasmuch as every man, when he supposes himself to have the power to do wrong, does wrong. For that there is far more profit for him personally in injustice than injustice is what every man believes and believes truly as the proponent of this theory will maintain. For if anyone who had got such a license within his grasp should, should refuse to do any wrong or lay his hands on others' possessions, he would be regarded as most pitiable and a great fool by all who took note of it though they would praise him before one another's faces, deceiving one another because of their fear of suffering injustice. So much for this point. Okay, so there is his irrefutable proof that we are all evil. Now, in laying this out, he made a distinction between what he calls nature and what he calls, oh, what was the phrase he used here? Convention of law. Let me highlight this part here. So there's nature and convention of law. What is this talking about here? And this is connecting to what we saw in the last section. And this is page 117, if you guys want to see this page I'm on. So towards the top of the page there. We should then catch the just man in the very act of resorting to the same conduct as the unjust man because of the self-advantage which every creature by its nature pursues as a good, while the convention of law, by the convention of law, it is forcibly diverted to pay honor to equality, in, in quotes. Right? 
we are all equals is the convention of law, but not our nature. Right? What is he saying there? Kind of what we mm. already mentioned, where uh, by nature we're competitive. You know, it's a doggy dog world. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with with law, with legislature, mm -hmm. it's supposed to prevent us all from being evil or, you know, that uh, leveling out of, you know, no one's too evil uh, <laughs> based on what rules we've we've set forth. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is very much consistent with what Thrasymachus had said, right, about how we all want to do commit injustice with impunity. It's very much right. consistent in saying that if we all had this ring to make us invisible, we would all steal and um, I don't know which words I can say on, on YouTube, um, but uh, we would as he put it here, lie with whomever he pleased and uh, do all these horrible things that the, even the just person would do this. But according to this argument, this kind of thinking, and of course, um, Glauca makes clear that this is not his own way of thought, but Thrasymachus or people like him might say that even Socrates would do this if he could do it with impunity and he had this ring, that there are no truly just people. It's just uh, a convention. And he ends here by saying that um, very much consistent with Thrasymachus, right? That if a person refused to do these wrongs, and this is towards the end here, should refuse to do any wrong, that person would be seen as a fool. But publicly, we would all praise that person because of convention saying that we should, convention teaches us that we're supposed to think this is good. Okay, so that's his position. And I think that we're not going to have time to go on to the next section, but if you have any comments, I see Jed is kind of itching to talk there. I see you messing with your microphone. It's the same single argument used by fascists and racists and um, staunch nationalists uh, and all the same sorts of people like that mm -hmm. all the time. They only mm -hmm. have one argument and it's always the same argument and it's always this. Mm -hmm. Nature shows that we are all terrible, selfish, cruel people. That's our nature. And there is this, and therefore it's the, the law of nature, survival of the fittest mm -hmm. to um, have a hierarchy with some people at the top, the king of the food chain, mm -hmm. and my race or my nation or my party or my religion, that's where we are. We are divinely chosen by God. We are, insert religion here, we are the chosen people. Insert race here, we are the superior race. Mm -hmm. It's the central argument. Because this is the law of nature, mm -hmm. then we get to, to, to do these terrible mm -hmm. things. Then there's a hierarchy. Not everyone is equal. It's the same thing. It's the mm -hmm. single thing. To tie the text to what you're saying, I think um, that there are many people who would say that those who recognize this and who are honest about it, like Thrasymachus, are the ones who are going to rise to the top. They're the smart ones, and so it's survival of the fittest in that sense that they're the smart ones. They're the they smart ones this. in that they, mm -hmm. yeah, in that they see this principle mm -hmm. that it's dog eat dog, mm -hmm. and there are natural hierarchies, mm -hmm. and the most terrible wins, mm -hmm. and they act on it. So mm -hmm. they they're smart enough to see it. There's the wisdom, and they're courageous enough to act on it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the other element of it. And that's that's the what these people think. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's the same argument. And what's interesting is um, not only do the people catch phrases that they, that they pick from, um, not only are they selective in it, they always point to examples that prove their point only. Like, oh, look at this character, Gyges. Look what he does. Look, mm -hmm. look, see, and therefore we all do it. Right. Which is a sort of bastardization a corruption um, of 
the argument Socrates made. Look, we have a pruning knife that has its function, <laughs> and therefore all things have its intended function, and therefore we can see what the intended function of the soul. He's doing the same thing. Look at, look at what, I mean, you could say we have infinite examples nowadays. Mm -hmm. Look at nature. Look at the alpha dog. Look at the alpha wolf or whatever. But here he's saying, look at Gyges. And therefore we can say all people are like that. And therefore we conclude this is, uh, this is about the soul. It's the same thing. This one example, mm -hmm. all things, and now the specific we're going to. Mm -hmm. They, they the cherry highest. pick examples and say that's everybody. Mm -hmm. They cherry pick examples. And it's the only argument. If we could knock down this argument, there would be no fascism. Mm -hmm. Essentially, there would be no warring nations because there would be no warring factions within humanity. We're mm -hmm. talking about the warring factions and the injustice within the world and within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because it's only one argument. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, it's the same argument that they then parlay into the next level. Mm -hmm. Seeing that the world is full of hierarchies. Seeing that it's survival of the fittest. It's dog eat dog. Seeing that we're all innately bad, selfish, ignorant. We therefore need a system that uh, to be a slave to. We need a system to be a follower of so that we can get along. And by the way, it's my system. Mm -hmm. So uh, growing up Catholic, they said, you're all sinners. Same argument. You're all innately bad. Therefore, you need our religious teaching, which has the hierarchy, you know, Pope, mm -hmm. cardinals, bishops, whatever. Mm -hmm. You need to be within this mm -hmm. system. By the way, we control it. Same thing with uh, capitalism. We're all innately selfish. That way, you need to have a capitalist system that lets the market decide. Every single time, it's the same thing. This first argument that you're innately bad, and therefore it's okay to have inequality in, in the world. And then, not only that, you need this social contract of this system that keeps you being good, you naughty little capitalists, criminals, mm -hmm. innately sinners. And so on and so on. It's only one argument. By the way, um, because of that first point, it's okay that we're going to sit on top of this structure. It's, it's one argument, yes. isn't it? Mm. That's fascinating to me. Yes, it's only this one argument. argument is still prevalent. And this was written, remember, like over 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. And the same argument is still in great force. And it's not like nobody's read this book, you know? <laughs> And yet still, um, but yeah, I think that very few people recognize it as a spiritual book. And like, as you were pointing out before, that um, there are a lot of arguments against book one, against the conclusion of book one, that Socrates' arguments do need to be laid out in a way that would challenge all of our assumptions that would cause us to reject those arguments. And we're still holding on to this idea, right? And so this is what Socrates then needs to address he needs to address the assumptions that would allow a person to keep holding on to this view that glaucon just laid out that Thrasymachus laid out in book one that eddie montes is about to lay out even stronger in the sections to come and so that's why the book is so long because socrates has to adjust all i'm sorry has to um address all of this in order to address the question, what is justice and why is it a value in and of itself? And so we're going to see how this builds next week as we go on to see how Socrates responds to this. And Adi Montes, Glaucon's brother, is going to add to it, try to make it even stronger. And they're going to challenge Socrates to show why justice is a value in and of itself and not just the reputation of justice. So he wants, they want to separate the thing in itself from the appearance that is, that is the social convention that is, um, is so desired by many. Okay, so that's where it's going what, next week. Mm, yes. Yes. Well, what's interesting is the, this argument that he just laid out is the inverse or the opposite of Socrates' argument. The mm. argument of um, the pruning knife is. If there is an intended function, 
there must be some designer that designed the pruning knife for that intended function. There must be a, 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 well, a destiny or a purpose which implies an excellence if you're fulfilling it well, which implies some sort of intelligent creator or end sustainer um, in enacting. Mm-hmm. That's the essence um, of Socrates' argument. There must be a creator creating and sustaining with an intended purpose for the pruning knife, for all things, for the soul. That can allow for there to be a good purpose and a, and a final, des- final mm-hmm. destination or a final destiny. That can allow for there to be an excellence if you're walking that path well and an injustice mm-hmm. if you're not. Mm-hmm. The, this argument here we're seeing in the beginning of book two is the opposite. It's not appealing to a higher intelligence and force that is creating and sustaining and caring. The, similar to the functions of an individual soul, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. It's going the opposite way. It's going, let's assume there's none of that. And let's just look at a particular dude. Let's see what this dude would do. It's a very, mm-hmm. um, by taking out that essential element to Socrates argument, it makes it relative or, or, or physical mm-hmm. and saying, well, there isn't any, and like there isn't all of these things that you implied in your argument to can come to the conclusion that there is such a thing as purpose, therefore excellence, mm. therefore virtue and justice. Mm. Let, there, there's just fulfilling your your immediate desires, and we'll mm. that's something we can all see and and look at this mm-hmm. guy who doesn't have all those things, Socrates. Look what he does. He just wants to lay with everyone and 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 mm. have all you know set his friends free from prison. And therefore, this is the way things are. And the essence to the um, argument that supports all of these people that are fascists and promote inequality is this is the way things are. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's, it and, the, and it's kind of a circular mm-hmm. argument. Look at this person. Mm-hmm. That's the way things are. And therefore, let's keep, do it, keep doing mm-hmm. it. But the interesting thing is, at its core, is this um, spiritual, I guess you would say, or, or higher intelligence nature of reality and of man and of the soul. So when I was upset with um, the way the argument went in the first book, it was that all of these things that are implied weren't made explicit. Mm-hmm. But now that I've seen the argument for injustice, which is the mm-hmm. most common thing we hear even today, Mm-hmm. I can see now that the essence of what Glaucon is putting forward for this argument is the opposite of that thing that wasn't made explicit. All he's doing is taking mm-hmm. away those implied elements of a higher mm-hmm. intelligence. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yes, yes. So if this is a very um, physical-centered notion of what it means to be human. And Socrates is going to have to take it in another direction. And he has to challenge then all of these assumptions about what it means to be human in order to show why his definition of justice is actually correct. And we've seen that in previous texts where we've said, oh, I don't know if this would be very um, appealing or convincing to a materialist. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and in Mm -hmm. other texts we've said, oh, yeah, like Socrates is making sense. But you have to sort of admit that there is a spiritual dimension to to life. Without that, Mm -hmm. it's hard to make, you know, the materialist one that we see putting forward here, it it seems a little Mm -hmm. bit more convincing. You you wouldn't go down to your local pub Mm -hmm. and be able to make that argument without Mm -hmm. first showing people there is a higher spiritual, there is an immortality of the soul. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. We've we've seen this before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And so on that note, I'm going to end it here. Those of you watching on YouTube, as always, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those below. And I do hope that you'll join us next week. Thank you very much. Salak. So